Good evening, everybody. My name is Martin Idens. I'm editor of the Times Literary Supplement and a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. I'm a former editor of the Sunday Times and a foreign editor of the Times. Um, this evening's uh, discussion uh, gets us away from uh, our little local difficulties in Britain uh, to a subject of far greater importance, I think, in, 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 the, uh, in history. Um, we're going to talk about a country that's been the unwilling uh, participant in the first major conflict in European history since 1945, Ukraine. This evening, we have a, a distinguished uh, 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 panel of guests, starting with Serhi Plochi, who you, you may know as um, an authority on uh, Ukrainian and Russian affairs. Uh, he was born in um, Russia, uh, but raised in Zaporizhia, the, uh, which is now part of the conflict zone. Um, he's uh, 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 a director of the Ukrainian Institute in, in Harvard, um, an author of uh, many authoritative works on, on Russian and Ukrainian cultural history, but more recently was a, uh, was a prize winner for his study of Chernobyl, and, and this year has published a, a follow-up to that, Atoms and Ashes, an account of uh, near misses in, in, uh, at, at uh, nuclear plants throughout the world, um, which we may hear more later. Um, Alessia Konrachek, uh, I'm delighted to, to, to greet you tonight. The, uh, Alessia is born in uh, Lviv, uh, in the western Ukraine. Um, she is director of the uh, Ukrainian Institute in London, um, a, a writer and a historian, and the author of, uh, of several studies of the murkier uh, uh, era of uh, the Second World War and of, post and of collaboration. And in addition to that, she's, she's, pu she's publishing a, a memoir of uh, the death of her brother on the, east, on the Eastern Front in Ukraine in 2017, called A Loss. Thank you. Um, Jana Thank you. Sorovich, Bickford, delighted to have you here, uh, a former uh, uh, um, citizen of um, uh, the Soviet Republic of Moldavia, whose family uh, moved to Israel. Um, she uh, lectures in international relations and is an executive on a, an Israeli company uh, that specializes in uh, detecting mines and attack tunnels. Um, amongst, uh, uh, so she knows of what she speaks with, uh, 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 when talking of war. Um, she's also uh, very bravely uh, been acting as a, a paramedic uh, in, um, uh, in the Ukraine and in the, in the refugee camps looking after the seriously wounded. And I hope to hear some more about that t uh, tonight. And, and lastly, but not leastly, uh, my old friend Radek Sikorsky, uh, um, who is um, uh, now is a, MEP, a European uh, Member of Parliament um, um, and also a, a, a senior fellow at Harvard. Um, in, his, in the course of his varied career, he's been uh, a Foreign Affairs Minister, Defence uh, Minister for Poland, uh, uh, an advocate of sanctions on Russia and a, and a firm friend uh, uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, he's also, again, knows of what he speaks. I first met him when he was a war correspondent working for both uh, British and uh, American uh, uh, publications. Uh, but he's Oxford trained uh, and has the dubious distinction of being a former member of the Bullingdon. No. <laughs> so all, all human life or not so human is here. Um, um, I'd, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to start um, with a, a simple question. Uh, Who's winning this war? Uh, why and how? Frederick? Um, <clears throat> I thought the war was coming when I read uh, uh, Putin's essay in July last year, in which he repeated all the myths of Tsarist and Soviet uh, propaganda, and when I learned that he ordered um, it to be uh, read by all his professional troops. I asked myself, why would you do that? And. To answer the question, you need metrics. Putin's war aims were, and I use the word advisedly, the final solution of the Ukraine problem. And I think they are best summed up in uh, a proclamation article uh, published by uh, Russia's official RIA Novosti uh, agency, uh, prematurely released when they thought they, had they were about to capture Kiev. And it was a plan to do to Ukraine what they'd done to Ukraine before. Extermination of elites, 
toleration of Ukraine as a sort of peasant folklore, but not as a democratic state that uh, chooses its own destiny. And by that definition, Putin has lost already. So we know who's losing. Um, Ukraine will win if it holds on to the great majority of its territory and is free to be a democracy that is uh, becoming a member of the uh, European Union. Um, both sides still think they can win, which is why there isn't a peace. Putin is still hoping that mobilization will work and that he can open an, uh, a northern front with uh, Belarus and somehow that um, uh, Ukraine will crack. Um, Ukrainians must be hoping that the Russian army will crack. Um, and there are signs of some rebellious uh, activities. Um, we have to, uh, I believe we are pursuing the correct policy and we have to uh, wait for events. Thank you. And uh, Jana, in terms of um, what you, you've seen on the ground, I mean, what, what did you think you know, was, was the spirit of you know, uh, resistance amongst the Ukrainian people? How did you find morale? I think that they're winning as well, and I think um, us are winning. And by us, I mean all the people who are against uh, tyranny and these dark regimes. And when I've been for two months uh, in Ukraine and I've met uh, physicians and people at the camp and regular people and soldiers, and I never heard even one regret <coughs> of fighting this war. They're united against the enemy. And all the people in Ukraine, they defending their own home, country, their kids, their wives. And Russian soldiers, most of them have no idea what are they doing there. So I'm sure our side will win. Yeah. Alessia. Unsurprisingly, mm. perhaps. Is my mic up? Yeah. Um, I, I will echo what the previous two speakers have already said. We are winning the war. And I'm really glad that you said we in a collective we because Ukrainians are winning on the ground. But we as allies of Ukrainians around the world in the democratic world are winning um, off the ground, as it were. Because this is a genocidal war against Ukraine, but it's a, also a war against democratic values, right? But there's one thing that a, a word of warning that I would have, and it's this kind of sense of new normal. Uh, that I'm beginning to witness. Uh, I've witnessed a bit of signs of Ukraine fatigue, of war fatigue, etc. Our prices are going up, energy blackmail is doing its business, it's working very well. Um, it's working at creating cracks in the solidarity uh, in, in Europe, right? Um, but there's also this idea of new normal. Okay, the war's been going on for eight, eight months now, nine years nearly, and eight months. Let's not forget that it started in 2014. It didn't start on the 24th of February. Um, and we sort of, you know, we sit back and we, we watch Ukraine, uh, Ukraine fight, we watch Ukraine win, we cheer, but we, we forget that we're also agents in this war too. And we, we, unless we stay focused and we stay tuned in, um, it can go in different directions, right? And one example of that is a few days ago, we saw renewed <coughs> mass bombardment of Ukrainian cities. I mean, much of Ukraine has been being bombarded for eight months, but we also saw that in my hometown, which was relatively safe in Lviv. We saw it in Kiev. We saw it everywhere from Western Ukraine to, to Kharkiv, Zaporizhia. I mean, Zaporizhia has been on the front line for a long time. And really, Ukrainians in October should not be reliving 24th of February again. By now, they should have had the appropriate air defense to defend their cities. The fact that they don't is a question, I think, to us and to our leadership. Why, why are they still mistrusted? Why don't they still receive what they've been asking for for so long? I mean, they've proved their capability to win beyond doubt by now. And I have a few answers to that question. I, mean, I really have one answer, but I want, don't want to take up too much time. We can come back okay. to that if you wish. Um, taking up Radek's points, uh, sir, he, um, he was, he was referring to a genocidal war, but it's also a war about the very existence of Ukraine, isn't it? I mean, that, 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 that what, what may be curious to, to, to the British and other Westerners is it's the, the, the denial that there is such a thing even as Ukraine. Uh, yes, that's, that's exactly where the war started, and Radek referred to that. There was an essay in, published in July of the last year which illustrated the key point that Putin had been making since 2013, that uh, Ukrainians and Russians are allegedly one and the same people. And when he was saying that and continues to say that, he doesn't mean that Russians are really Ukrainians 
or that the Russians don't exist as a nation. What he means is the Ukrainians are really Russians and they don't exist or they have no right to exist. And uh, that is something that comes exactly from the <coughs> writings of, um, some, of the uh, some of the Russian intellectual figures from mid 19th century, the Russian generals of the beginning of the 20th century. The idea that uh, uh, Ukrainians or little Russians was a, just a subgroup of a big Russian nation existed, existed certainly uh, was the, the dominant narrative of the Russian Empire. It, it came to an end with the revolution, and that is one of the reasons why Putin doesn't like Lenin or even the Stalinist nationality policies because they allegedly created, created Ukraine. So this is a return going back in time, an attempt to switch clock back to the 19th century, back to pre-World War I uh, situation. And in that sense, Ukrainians had already won when they showed during the first week of the, uh, of the war that both Putin and his generals in Moscow and the friends of Ukraine in Washington and in London were wrong when they didn't believe that Ukraine would not go for more than one week. So the victory was there on that level. Ukraine will stay. Now, who is winning this war in, in, in terms of territory, in terms of what will happen with that place, what will happen with Europe, what will happen with the world, the battle is not over, the outcome is not decided yet. And uh, whatever was achieved so far was achieved as the result of two factors coming together. The first one was the resilience of the Ukrainian people. It turned out that Ukraine had an army that could actually fight and wouldn't disappear overnight like it happened with the Afghan army a few, a few uh, months earlier. But another major factor was really quite unprecedented since the fall of the Berlin Wall, sort of a unity and support on the part of the West. The West is back, and this is actually one of the reasons why Russia uh, couldn't win the war until now. But for Russia not to win that war, for the world to win, and, and values there are at, at, at the very center of the conflict. It, it's not just something that the Ukrainians are using to solicit more support. They, they believe that they're fighting for Europe. They believe at the time when, of course, some leave Europe. Uh, they, they believe that they, that they are fighting for the values, but they need, they, 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 they need support. They need help. And again, the battle, the battle is not over, and it's too early to declare victory on that other level more than just symbolic level, that some form of Ukraine would exist. Radek, why do you think that this war involves so much savagery? I mean, war is never a, 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 a pleasant business, but, it, but on the Russian side in particular, it seems to be a, a, a tactic of, of Vladimir Putin to engage in atrocity. I mean, some of you may have read, in, even in recent days, about how um, Ukrainian children are being separated from their parents uh, when captured by the, you know, uh, by the Russian army. It's a sort of behavior we haven't seen for, for, for decades in Europe. Does, that, does there something that explain that sort of pattern behavior too? This is really mm. sinister, isn't mm. it? I mean, uh, one is immediately reminded of uh, the Argentinian generals first mm. killing the parents and then handing over the children to their own supporters. And in Poland during the Second World War, Nazi Germany would have these, uh, actually, very near to where I live, these selection camps where, where they would take nice blonde children and give them for adoption uh, and Germanization uh, to p people back home. So when Putin talks about Nazis, he should look in the mirror um, because some of these methods uh, we haven't seen since that period. Can I jump in there? Of course. I mean, as a historian of the Second World War, I find it really difficult to resist that kind of question. Mm. Um, I don't think he needs to look in the mirror. I mean, the mirror, yes, yeah, to see himself, to see <laughs> Russia, not to see necessarily Nazi Germany reflected in the mirror, because he doesn't need to. Because if we look at the tactics of the Soviet army in the Second World War, um, then we'll see mass rapes. We all know about this history, right? We'll see looting 
on absolutely industrial scale. And we'll also see this idea of liberation. So when the, when the Soviet army uh, turned up into Poland, I mean, there's a reason why the Second World War is referred to in Russia to this day as the Great Patriotic War, 1941 to 1945, because they don't like to talk about what happened in 1939, when they essentially, together with Hitler, um, uh, destroyed the Polish state. And when they turned up into what is now Western Ukraine and annexed Western Ukraine, they were liberating the Ukrainians from Poles, right? And these liberators were shocked to find out that the poorest peasants in the poorest part of Europe were actually much better off than they were. You know, they were shocked to see the relative wealth of the population they were supposedly uh, liberating. And that, I've been thinking about those episodes a lot when I was watching uh, this horrendous footage of, you know, the, the washing machine has become a, a symbol of, of Russian conquest, of, of the Russian army, or these soldiers getting excited at the sight of an Atella jar. It's pathetic, right? But this is, th these are the things that we should have learned from the Second World War and realized that the Russian army <coughs> did not reform after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The perpetration of war crimes is an accepted and encouraged method of fighting a war. It is encouraged, it's not penalized at all. Um, I, I, I'd like to think that we learn something from history, but I'm not sure we do. Is it an no, effective tactic of war? I mean, in the First World War, I think it used to be called Schrecklichkeit, when it was, uh, I think the, the, the Kaiser referred to it, frightfulness as a, an instrument of war. Does it, does it work? It's effective if it's not punished. It right? doesn't. And the, the, the last time the British Army behaved like that was, I think, in Spain during the P Peninsula War. And it was then seen that it augments resistance. Mm. And then it, uh, it stopped. And in that sense, the Russian Army has never uh, modernized. You know, the deal between Russia and her soldiers is we pay you very little, we treat you very badly, but, but you can do stuff that is normally criminal. Um, and it's counterproductive because just like those that this latest bombing of cities, I think, is going to be hugely counterproductive. So uh, I came here from uh, from uh, Germany, and I think the result will be that the Germans will finally start uh, um, delivering tanks to Ukraine because this has evoked uh, images of German cities and of London being being bombed, and uh, and people react to that. I'd and Jana, like you've seen the damage on the ground, haven't you? Yes, you but know? I would like to add uh, first that in Ukraine, uh, people call him Putler, <coughs> not, uh, not Putin. <coughs> and when I'm thinking about it and was listening to, uh, to Hitler propaganda, it's actually the same speech that um, West is guilty, we're not, we're liberating, is actually the same behavior. And tr my German friends, uh, in terms of guilt, now they're saying, oh, now we're fine because uh, Russian, Russians are much worse than us. So no guilt. We're finished with, with the guilt. And um, about the atrocities, um, when I came to Ukraine, um, I mean, I'm Israeli. I live in Israel. Uh, I was born in a city near Odessa. So for me, Ukraine is a motherland as well. And I decided to go. And after uh, pictures, very picturesque, I would say, because when you go to the, to the war zone and you, before that you're seeing news, the camera takes only frames. So you see only part of the view. And while you're standing there and it's surrounding you, um, the smell of death, it's kind of stench, I would say, burned trees and ruined homes, um, silence, it, it, it's striking. And uh, on the second day of, um, of my journey, we went to uh, collect a, a girl from, from Kharkiv. And with no disrespect to British Island, but I think people don't understand the, the size of Ukraine. It, it, it's a huge country. So in order to collect um, an injured person, we had to go from Kiev for five hours only by cars because there was no uh, civilian air traffic. Uh, for five hours to Kharkiv, collecting a person and then going for 13 hours in the ambulance uh, to Lviv. And there, uh, German or Italian teams uh, were collecting them uh, for further treatment. Um, so, uh, first girl, she was 15 years old and she went to, to buy some groceries and she was caught by a um, missile with uh, um, a warhead that uh, inside of it, it's a cluster, and 
inside this cluster is thousands of metal beans and arrows that I brought one. I think that's very important because people, show, people talk about cluster bonds, but, but you're going to show us exactly what it means. Yeah, so it's, it's a metal arrow and it's very sharp. You can see that and you can, uh, you can pass through the audience, mm. just be sure about having it back. And thousands of them flying on enormous <laughs> speed, injuring and killing everything. Uh, surrounding the dismissal. So this girl was caught there and her spine was completely crushed by those things, uh, <laughs> leaving her unable to walk and, and breathe by herself. Um, so we collected her from the uh, hospital in Kharkiv. I went there to collect her bag and I was supposed to meet the ambulance with this girl on the other side of the corridor of the hospital. Uh, I collected her bag and I started to walk the corridor and it was a very hot day, um, so no air conditioning and the smell of human bodies and antiseptics and while I was walking it was an uh, open door in each room on each side of the corridor and only part of the second that I looked in each room it was a person there lying on the lying on the bed with no um, arms or legs and bandages uh, soaked with blood. I felt that at the end of this corridor I was a bit different because I couldn't even imagine so much suffer in um, concentrated in, in one hospital and for me it looked like a proper hell. I think hell should look like that but I couldn't imagine it was made for people. And sometimes, um, as Radek was uh, recounting, you know, the uh, committing of atrocities actually undermines uh, the army that, or the forces that, um, that, that do it. I mean, do you think, what do you think of the state of uh, Russian uh, morale, Serhi, as far as you? Well, uh, morale is quite low. They, they didn't know what they were doing in Ukraine at the very beginning. Then um, the idea was, again, they, they came allegedly to liberate people. They realized that they were not welcomed, that they were hated. That they turned after this first two or three days of alleged liberation to, to looting and, and rape and, and killing. And with every liberated today, Ukrainian village or town, there are mass graves that have been being butcher is now became not just a place, it's a symbol that there are many other butchers and situ situ situations like that and mass graves like that. And uh, what is happening also beyond, beyond the, the, the conduct of the war itself, uh, the war was started and we were talking about that at the beginning with the idea that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people. And uh, many Ukrainians they, they didn't accept the idea, but there was the idea that, okay, the, there are the people who are close to each other culturally, historically, and otherwise. So the, the level of violence, the atrocities, produced the result where there is a relatively mass movement of people today in Ukraine switching from uh, uh, Russian to Ukrainian as a symbolic act that we don't want to have anything in common with, with the country, with the nation, with the culture that does that to us. And uh, that means that, again, if the overarching idea was of conquering Ukraine and turning them into the Russians, what the war produces, and in particular atrocities, what produces is actually forming and a much stronger, much conscious of itself nation that there was there before, 20, 20, before the February of this year, and especially before um, March of um, 2014, because the war, again, unless I was talking about that, it didn't start this February. It started in February of 2014 with the Russian special forces taking over the buildings of the Crimean parliament and Crimean uh, government and dragging in the deputies of, of the parliament and the members of the government to vote at that time not on the uh, um, annexation of the Crimea, but on extension of the Crimean constitution. And then, and, and then, of course, that followed. So that war that started in 2014, that continues today, produces a much 
much stronger nation in Ukraine than there was before. Again, if, if there is any silver lining at all, I'm doubtful whether war can produce that. That would be one of them. Can I also raise a, a, another item of silver lining? Um, in 1940, uh, Britain had its Churchill, France had its de Gaulle, uh, and Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, you know, I want to. I think it's a fascinating figure. You know, the rise for, of, a, of a man who was a, a comedian, a rather good one from the, the excerpts I've seen on television and uh, broadcast here, into uh, into a statesman. Uh, would any member of the panel like to talk about the Zelensky phenomenon? I think he was more of a satirist than the comedian, Kim, more, yes. more yes minister than Benny Hill. You know? You've been very generous. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that meant that um, uh, he understands the power of a narrative. Mm. And he understood that the narrative can't end with him escaping Kiev. You know, that the next chapter has to be um, him doing the right thing. And, uh, and yes, he's, he's become a, a global icon uh, uh, a, a, and a tremendous uh, historical significance. Because if he'd done what Putin expected him to do, which is to, to do the Ashraf Ghani, um, uh, then Ukraine would have, might have lost the invasion. I think it would still have eventually uh, won the guerrilla war, but the price would have been even higher. I would like to add as well. Because I think Zelensky, he is from the new era, the new era of social media and television, and he is uh, a proper master in that. And people relate to, to stars, and he is definitely a star, um, very young, charismatic. Um, he behaves very differently from uh, all the leaders we know. And so he's so popular and I've seen in these two months kind of a refusion of Ukrainian identity. Um, uh, for example, when we were coming back with a big uh, team of physicians from uh, Hungarian border uh, refugee camp during the night, and in order to relax, they were walking <laughs> in the train, telling funny story, drinking. So I, I couldn't hold my drink enough uh, long enough. Uh, they were singing in Ukrainian and uh, telling fun stories and always relate to we. We are as Ukrainians. We will win. We will do. And Zelensky, he is such a cool guy. Calling, they call him a cool guy, a different guy, part of, um, of new identity, part of someone who can think differently. And they always relate to him as a young person who took other young people for example, uh, Klitschko, the mayor of, uh, of Kiev, to, to do a new step, a different behavior, a new era, new people, young people. So it's a different identity. Yeah, uh, well, I, 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 I certainly agree with what Jana just said. And uh, um, my own reading, reading of Zelensky and, and this really phenomenon that is now a global phenomenon uh, echoes what, what what Radek and Diana were saying. In, in, in my reading, he, uh, what brings together the two careers of, of, of Zelensky, that of an actor and that of the, of the president, is that I think that his biggest talent is actually filling the audience and, and understanding what the audience wants. And saying that maybe a few seconds, in two, a few minutes before we ourselves verbalize those things. And in that sense, he's an amplifier of what, what Ukrainians are, what Ukrainians think, how they felt. He was there until the moment the, the bomb started to fall, uh, saying what the, Amer the, the Ukrainian people wanted to hear, what they thought, that the war was not coming, that the war was impossible. Anything of that sort would be impossible. But once the bombs were there, Ukrainians changed their mind, and Zelensky helped them to change that mind. He led them. He led them now in a new direction. At no point, at the, at the worst moments in the war, which is late February, early, uh, early March, there was no less than 75, 80% of the people in Ukraine polled who didn't believe in the victory. 
It's almost you look at that sitting in, in the US or UK and asking, what are you smoking, guys? D don't you know what is, what is going on? And I would say 15 to 20% of that was Zelensky. But then still 60% were the people of Ukraine. And, and he is, is uh, someone who gives that voice, who, who, who provides, provides uh, assurance for, for the people that what they think, what they felt, this is, this is the right approach. And last but not least, you started with Churchill. He himself and his team, uh, they're absolutely unbelievably fantastic in terms of the, uh, as word crafters. I, I, I really, again, Churchill is of course famous for that, but I, I really can't, can't put anyone in, in terms of the number of speeches and the quality of how it is done and the message that is there uh, on par with, uh, with Zelensky at least in, in, the last, in the last 15 to 20 years. And uh, um, that's, that's of course also helps and helpful. And, and he is out there, he is, he is speaking to the audiences on Zoom, to, to, to university, to, to, to the, to the uh, um, film audiences, to uh, uh, Ukraine, and I would say Europe and the world really got lucky that at that particular moment there was that sort of a leader. Yes, just to add that we are, I completely agree with all the speakers, but just to add that we are so keen on focusing on um, the, the great men, and they still are mostly men these days, even now. Um, and um, I, I think I'd like to maybe take your argument a little bit further, that you know, mm. as, as, as much as we all appreciate, and I think Ukrainians appreciate that Zelensky didn't leave Kiev, and that he, you know, he, um, he faced up the challenge that was in front of him, he also, felt not just his audience, but he also knew what the expectations of Ukrainian society uh, was. And if we paid a little bit more attention to the Ukrainian society and not just the Ukrainian mm. government over the last at least eight years, at least since the start of Orange Revolution, uh, not Orange Revolution, the, the Maidan Revolution, we would know that society has ownership of statehood. You know, these are the people who will step in and replace state institutions when state institutions have either collapsed or are on shaky ground. And I think he knew that very well, that if unless he faces up to that challenge, his political career is over, his any career is over, right? So he, um, uh, yeah, so he met the expectations of society. So let's not forget the role of society mm -hmm. while focusing on the leadership of uh, Zelensky himself. And I would like to add that he is talking as he's a servant because one of his show called The Servant of the People. Why is party? <laughs> yes, and while he was talking to people, still now he's saying, I'm not leading you to victory. I'm serving you to victory. So I think it's a, bit a big difference. But I think his style of leadership also reflects the character of the people, mm -hmm. namely um, suspicion of authority and a, a grounds up kind of self-organization very different from uh, the Russian uh, collective uh, character, which is to submit to dictatorial authority. And in that sense, Ukrainians are, of course, much more European. Can I take the conversation on to what I suppose uh, for members of the audience would be the sum of all our fears? I mean, I know it's a conversation that crops up in my office at work, but it's the fear of nu nuclear escalation. Um, uh, Sometimes we know that the, these threats you know, are, are made to impress us, but I think there is something genuinely terrifying uh, about the thought of a, a conflict breaking out uh, with the use of, uh, uh, the, of, of the nuclear uh, uh, bomb. Um, Serhi, this is one of your areas of study. Do you, should, how seriously should we uh, uh, take Mr. Putin's threats? Uh, well, we should take them very seriously. Uh, it's, uh, we are in, in, in the new situation and in uncharted waters in many ways. On the one hand, there is a lot of talk about the return of the Cold War and uh, the return of the, of the nuclear age. But uh, there is also kind of uh, belief, uh, not even hope, it's belief. We survived the Cold War, the nuclear weapons uh, uh, were contributing factor to the situation that there was no third world war, so maybe the nuclear weapons would continue to perform that, that same role. 
And uh, the, the, the trick there is that it's not the nuclear weapons per se that contributed to the long peace after 1945, <laughs> global peace. It's the fear of the nuclear weapons. It's, 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 it's the realization that you can't use them because there will be a response. And after the Cold War, we already more than 30 years, new generation of people, new voters, new politicians who came, came to, to life, to power, to, to accepted the world as the nuclear weapons didn't exist anymore. The fear that stopped the world during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis from, from uh, m m war, from collapse, it, it's not with us today. And uh, uh, we have to relearn how to, to treat this very seriously. Uh, it, comes, it, it, it comes slowly. The, the, the war in Ukraine went nuclear already on its very first day, with the takeover of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And there was no reaction. The International Atomic Energy Agency, for the first week after the start of the war, was issuing statement in which they wouldn't even use the word Russia, appealing to the both sides to exercise constraint and so on and so forth. Well, Russia is still the member of the Security Council. The election of the leaders of the organization, UN-linked uh, organization, depends on Russian vote. Their budget, the, the paychecks that they're paying their, uh, their, their staff depends on the contributions. So we are completely found ourselves in a new situation. The war, conventional war, came first to Chernobyl, then to the Parisian nuclear power plant. And, and, and there were just a couple of statements, and institutionally, the world turned out to be unprepared in terms of the uh, legal base, unprepared. And now we are getting a new, new level of nuclear threats where the leader of the country that is member of the Security Council declares annexation of the territory that his army is not even controlled and sends a signal that if that annexation is challenged, he is prepared to use, to use nuclear, uh, nuclear weapon against the country that was denuclearized in the 1990s under the pressure from not just Russia, but from the United States and then UK and, and, and France were, were co-guarantors who were issuing assurances. So now this country is being uh, Nuclear power plants are being taken over by invading army, and there is a threat of using nuclear weapons not against U.S., not against, but against against Ukraine. And uh, the, if the, the the only way, if we, if there is anything to learn from world, from from the Cold War, is to understand that the nuclear weapons on themselves just it's not the weapons that refuse to be fired. It's the fear that the response would be on the same level, that the response would actually raise the, 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 the cost of that, of that sort of a decision that would be higher than what I can get by uh, using the nuclear weapon. That what saved us back during the Cold War. And we don't know much what is happening behind the closed doors, what kind of messages were being delivered to, to Kremlin. But as the historian and the historian of Cold War, I can tell you that unless it is very clear what, what will be happening, unless it is very clear that the other side means that, the nuclear weapons on themselves will not, will not save us from anything. They, they will make the situation more dangerous. Alessa, I saw you taking. I, I agree that we are back in the uh, uh, second nuclear age. Uh, because uh, all the tyrants around the world have noticed that uh, if you give up your nuclear warheads, you get invaded. Yeah. Uh, but people are uh, fearing this, um, not only as regards <coughs> Zaporozhye and uh, Chernobyl, but as Putin's implicit and, not, and, 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 uh, and explicit threat to use tactical nukes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's just bombed your hometown, Zaporozhye, with uh, conventional weapons. Um, it, it happens. It, it happens daily. nightly, nightly <laughs> almost. Yeah. Which, which, which is according to him an attack on Russia because he had an ex Zaporozhye, right? So according to his own threats, he who um, attacks Russia should be nuked. So he actually should be nuking himself. Um, but where, where, but to be where, where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> but to be serious. Um, 
uh, the use of tactical nukes would be against Russia's own uh, doctrine, uh, which says that only if the existence of Russia were threatened would Russia be using it. But you can't exclude it because he's broken his words and what's a doctrine to him? Uh, but I understand that it's not so easy. Um, uh, the use of tactical nukes goes through the normal uh, uh, chain of command of the army. So all his generals would have to want to um, um, carry out such an order. In other words, they would have to choose. Do they become genocidal war criminals or do they remove the, the person who is giving such an order? So that would be a moment of, of actually great danger for Putin. Secondly, um, uh, the warheads are not at the front. The warheads are in uh, depots uh, uh, deep inside Russia. We, of course, monitored them closely. I'm told we would know um, five, even seven days in advance uh, before he could use them. Um, and I would hope that in those circumstances, it's not only the United States, which has already told him um, quite specifically what dire consequences would follow, but also India and above all, China would then tell him, this is too far, stop it or else. And I think China has that power. Do you remember in January, there was a brief Russian foray into uh, a struggle for power in Kazakhstan and they withdrew after a week. I'm told because the Chinese read them the riot act, threatened to cut all links. And China, uh, Russia is now a vassal of China. I think that kind of threat would, uh, uh, would deter Putin, hopefully. Just, Just very briefly to reiterate what Serhii was already saying, uh, because Serhii is one of those few voices that talks about civilian uh, threat and civilian <coughs> nuclear objects. We focus a lot on the potential nuclear um, um, uh, nuclear war um, because of Putin's nuclear blackmail, but we don't talk enough about nuclear terrorism and essentially, you know, having the largest European nuclear power plant being occupied already and the management being kidnapped, terrorized, tortured, uh, and so on. It doesn't really, it's not really in the, in the main news at all in this country or elsewhere. And it's just as threatening for Ukrainians. I mean, we're, we're in the position when the rest of the world is in the position to, privileged position, I would say, to choose, well, do we uh, feel threatened by bluffing or not bluffing Putin uh, about, um, Putin bluffing or not bluffing about nuclear war? Ukrainians have a choice. What do we fear more? Uh, conventional nuclear, well, not conventional, nuclear weapons or, or um, a, a hitting of a nuclear plant through negligence or design because it could be either mm. because we've seen so much negligence in the Russian army as well so it could be an accident as well so we need and I don't think the world has response appropriate response if something like that was to happen but for Ukrainians it's just as disastrous as as the use of nuclear weapons yeah. is the West doing enough to help do you think Jana you're part of that uh, yes, no, that, I, that I, I think yes and not just countries because uh, uh, people uh, trying to, to open NGOs. For example, I was mm. volunteering in the association uh, called Frida, uh, two Israeli guys who created it and paying from uh, their own money. So many people <coughs> are trying to help not, to, not just countries. So I think um, um, most of the world trying to help but the using Ukraine, not using Ukraine, um, Ukraine is in, fr in the front fighting for them and I think they appreciate it and I wanted to add on the uh, nuclear thing because um, uh, we've seen the state of Russian army the the corruption so sometimes uh, I'm thinking um, these um, nuclear heads are from the 60s so it might be at the same sta state as Russian army it might uh, not work <laughs> I don't, I don't, we don't want to put that into. <laughs> well, some Russian <laughs> rockets are actually exploding on launch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Putin has yeah. to think about that too, and his army is certainly not prepared to fight Definitely. in a in a contaminated environment. And as you said, the uh, winds in Europe blow mostly from west to east. So, th so, so uh, th th these are <coughs> very serious um, uh, risks for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do, do, do you get a sense also on the ground in, 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 from Ukraine that do, do, they, do they feel they've got our support? Um, 
When I've been at the refugee camp, mm. uh, mostly women mm. with kids and, and pets, um, they were quite numbed, impossible to talk, mm. shocked because their husband's fighting somewhere or already dead. And I was hugging them and they were answering me, uh, th thank you so much for seeing us, knowing that we're suffering, coming uh, for your own will to help us. So I think maybe they need to feel more support from, uh, from the West. Lisa. I, I don't live in Ukraine. Mm. I visited a, a month ago or so, but obviously I'm in touch with a lot of volunteers, with a lot of soldiers, with a, a, a lot of people who are there. I mean, it's a part of my family is in some occupied territories fighting and so on. So I think there's a lot of gratitude for the help that has arrived and a lot of it has arrived and of course that's why I'm you know referring to us winning this war but there's a lot of frustration at the pace at which it arrived at the delays and still this idea of mistrust that I mentioned right at the start of this discussion and in my view there's still this perception of Ukraine as a bit of a buffer zone there's still a lack of understanding that Ukraine is a country with a very clear idea of self and very clear determination and vision of the future uh, and what they're fighting for and that they, they, their only option is to win because if they don't win, there's no Ukraine. Um, but there's still this, this sort of relegation of that territory is a buffer zone between Russia and the rest of Europe and Europe proper, right? And if it's a buffer zone, then we don't care about it. And the, the reason why, or we don't care enough about it, and the reason why we don't consider it as a as a state as we might, I don't know, think of France or Italy or Russia, is because our knowledge of Ukraine is extremely poor. And the knowledge, I mean, this is a reading public, and I don't, I don't necessarily want to put you on the spot, but maybe we could do it without putting your hands up just internally. I wonder how many people here can name at least one Ukrainian author, and how many have one book or several on their bookshelves that are written by Ukrainian authors. Like I say, please just answer that in private. But that is how we learn, that's how we put places on mental maps, right? And so the way we've learned about Ukraine is through Moscow, is through Moscow's eyes, right? And the, le the way we've learned about Russia is also through Moscow's eyes. And that is why in February, everybody, apart from people who know Ukraine, were shocked at defiance. Those who know Ukraine in East Central Europe were not shocked at Ukrainian defiance. They understood the Ukrainians were going to be defined. And also those who don't know Russia experientially as someone, as a country that has been acting as an empire for a long time and continues to act so, were shocked at brutality. We were not shocked at that brutality. East Central Europeans were not shocked at the level of brutality because we know it differently, right? So until we fill that gap in our knowledge, Ukraine will still be a buffer zone and it will still feel frustrated. Right. Well, thank you very much, panel. The, uh, I'd like to now throw open the floor you know, uh, and take questions. Um, Thanks. Um, in the American Civil War, uh, it looked like it might have ended in a stalemate until General Sherman decided that he wasn't just going to focus on convincing Lee that he was licked, but that he had to convince the Southern aristocracy that to continue to lend moral support to the Confederate cause would mean their own personal destruction. So we've talked a lot about Putin, but what will it take to actually convince the Soloviki, the oligarchs, and just the average Russians that to continue to lend support to Putin uh, will mean their own destruction. Yeah, uh, how, long, how long has Putin got? Mm. That's a tough one, mm. but I can mm. imagine a scenario in which uh, Russian soldiers do to their officers what they did in 1917, when they would rather shoot the officers rather than fight. There, uh, it, it, there are some indications that they really don't want to, to, to be in this war. Um, and, um, the trouble with Putin and the, uh, the war party is that, that their uh, failure is both a desirable end of this war, but also a precondition for peace. Because Putin has put himself in the position of, of Hitler after he broke Munich and after he took over all of Czechoslovakia. You cannot make peace with this man because his word and signature are worthless. Uh, and, um, and 
And at the same time, there is no succession mechanism in <clears throat> Russia. You know, when, um, when um, Stalin died, Beria tried to take over, but the Politburo you know, finally got a couple of generals uh, uh, outside uh, the, the, the room, and they voted him down, and the generals <laughs> took over Beria, and that was it. And then when Khrushchev screwed up, there was a vote, and he was pensioned off. Today, theoretically, um, Putin is the democratically elected leader of Russia. Um, so, um, uh, so they would have to have a new election. Uh, but first, Putin would have to either be retired or, or as the Americans say, terminated with extreme prejudice. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't count on the rebellion of the Russian soldiers at all, because um, even though we've seen about 300,000 uh, Russian draft dodgers leave the country, massive exodus, right? Um, as far as I understand, I think I read this morning that two-thirds of the mobilization that Putin announced has been filled. Mm -hmm. So he's got enough people to fight with. And if it's not qual qual quality that he's looking for, quantity is also good enough. Because as we know again from history, um, Moscow fights, you know, treats its people as cannon fodder. And that is how a lot of battles in the Second World War and the Eastern Front were won. And so, yeah, I, let's not relax into you know, the idea that the morale is low. It, it doesn't matter if it's low. It's still a, a very capable fighting force. Take another question. Gentleman down is first. How, how worried should we be about this new appointment of Putin, General uh, Solovokin? Uh, so, sorry, Solovokin who is a brute, and we can visibly see, since he's been appointed, that there's been some actions which, are di which has been different than what they've been doing before. And the second question, who blew the pipeline, the North Street? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Who wants to take that? So he? Okay, yeah, I can. <clears throat> um, well, uh, with regards to the change of the commanding officer, I don't think it it's, it's has any impact or will have any impact on what is happening there. Reports that we are getting is that Mr. Putin directly is involved in uh, um, issuing orders to the commanders where to move, where, where not to move, and that is one of the reasons why the war is fought so poorly on the Russian side. It's not just the low morale, it's also strategically, strategically major, major blunders. And in that sense, who will be filling that, that position in between the commanders on the ground and the decision maker in Kremlin uh, doesn't, doesn't matter much. He was the commander of the uh, um, southern uh, flank of that, of, of, of that Russian uh, um, uh, army before that. Uh, again, I don't think that the main decisions, including the, the decisions, uh, mass bombardment of Ukraine and Ukrainian cities, in the last week or two were really his to make. They, they were made uh, up, uh, higher up. Uh, in terms of the, uh, of the uh, North Stream, again, the, the investigation is going on. And what, what I hear from confidential sources is that the, the all arrows point, of course, in the direction that we, we suspected it would be. Russia has uh, enormous, en enormous money to make out of uh, uh, claiming that that was an accident and for that reason it can't, it can't supply the gas that it was supposed to supply otherwise. Uh, and uh, um, again, that's, that's in terms who, who benefits or doesn't benefit from, from that accident. But uh, also, again, th there is a very serious work done, and maybe I can tell more, very seriously in terms of documenting what, what happened there. Uh, and uh, I think that we will get, get the result relatively soon. And the sort of the result that would be really difficult to cha challenge, either, either in terms of the forensic evidence, in terms of the, or uh, in, in legal terms. Thank you. <coughs> Is there a lady? Oh, there was a lady over there. Mm. <coughs> Speaking as somebody who's rather ignorant of the Ukraine, as you um, <laughs> referred to earlier, I just don't understand why was the response to the 2014 invasion so muted? And, and why was it bloodless? Why is it apparently bloodless? 
Oh, who wants to take that out? Well, I was involved in the events of 2014. Um, what happened was that uh, President uh, Yanukovych first promised he would, like, he would sign an association agreement uh, with the European Union. He then reneged on his word and, uh, and, and Ukrainians started protesting. And there was a massacre and uh, there was a mission of uh, EU foreign ministers, which I led to, uh, to uh, have a deal uh, to stop the, uh, the, the killing. And then Yanukovych did something very weird. He, uh, he left Kiev, he went to the east uh, and underestimated the revulsion that people felt against the, the massacre. And it led to his escape from the country. When the Russians started the operation in Crimea that you've already referred to, the country didn't have a president. The Speaker of Parliament was acting president. And I think somewhat also under Rus uh, Western pressure, uh, Ukraine did not fight back in Crimea. No, no, no shot was fired, with, uh, which I, with hindsight I think was a mistake. Mm -hmm. If there had been resistance in Crimea, the Russians might not have tried to do those putches, which succeeded in Donetsk and uh, Lugansk, but failed in Zaporozhye, and Mykolaiv, and in Odessa. Um, uh, and also, Ukraine at that time hardly had an army. I'm told that some brigades and even divisions existed only as bank accounts, because there was those total corruption, uh, which Yanukovych was the, uh, was the president uh, who, who himself was uh, uh, very corrupt. Um, and what Putin um, didn't understand is that uh, the Ukrainian army really learned to fight and reformed and, uh, uh, and, and became modern with some Western ex assistance in that low-level fight in Donbas from, from 2014. And he also should have learned at that time that, the, that, that he was unwelcome in Ukraine, but he, he, he didn't internalize that, uh, that message. And uh, lastly, I would just add a third reason why he failed in the invasion this year. He invaded Ukraine with his insufficient forces. Ukraine is huge. huge. He, Russians are battling space as much as the Ukrainians. Uh, his land component was 100,000 troops. Think about it. That's one large US football stadium. And it was smaller than the standing Ukrainian army. Whereas your basic um, rule of thumb since Clausewitz is that uh, if you're the attacking force, you should have a superiority of three to one, and when conquering cities, at least five to one. He had nothing like those forces. Alessia, do you think um, Britain uh, and the United States were, to take that point up, were uh, guarantors of uh, Ukrainian independence, uh, the Budapest Mem Memorandum? Why do you think we played such a small role, both of those countries, in 2014? Well, it's not for me to answer why. I, I, I just, I suppose I would like to highlight that had we not played such a small role and had we not turned a blind eye to what Putin was doing, you know, completely disregarding international law, invading another country, have, you know, performing a modern day Anschluss and we've just accepted it and sort of, you know, said, oh, that's not very nice, is it? And introduced some sanctions that really were not particularly meaningful. Um, we probably wouldn't be in this position now. Um, because, uh, because he learned. And this is a lesson for us to remember now, that the more there are calls for appeasement, the more green light he sees to escalate. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that if he's appeased, if he's allowed to keep a little bit of Ukraine, well, that bit, maybe the slightly smaller bit, but that's a destroyed bit anyway. Why would you want it in Ukraine anyway? Just let him keep it. It doesn't work like that. He sees it as permission to escalate. And I'd just like to also add to what Radek was saying about Ukrainian army changing when my brother volunteered in 2015. I mean, that was a very different type of army. And even then, in 2014, the army started to consist, essentially, the main formidable fighting force were, were uh, um, volunteer battalions. Well, the volunteer battalions that were armed and dressed and provided for by society, by Ukrainians themselves, out of their own pocket, families, uh, NGOs. Uh, the diaspora collected huge amounts of money to, uh, to essentially make sure that that is a fighting force. Um, and that was the case in 2015 when my brother volunteered as well. It's a very different fighting force now. It's highly motivated as well because it's a force that is defending the country. And also it's an army that consists not just of professional soldiers, but citizens of the country. You know, IT specialists, poets, writers, 
so many of my friends who had decent, normal, regular day jobs and never thought of joining the army are fighting at the moment. They have something to protect. What they're protecting is their, is their ordinary life, the sort of lives that you and I are enjoying at the moment. They know, they know what they want to go back to. It's a highly motivated force and it's going to be extremely difficult to fight against. By the way, we can all help. Um, there is an effort to supply pickups for the Ukrainian army. They need them, used pickups. There's a, there's a Swedish NGO called Blagula Bilen. Uh, they buy these pickups, paint them, check them, and uh, a, a group of Polish volunteers are delivering them um, to, uh, to the front line. Uh, for about 10,000 euros, you can sponsor a pickup for Ukraine. If you want the details, I can tell you. Yeah. One last. Gentlemen, over there. Thank you. I see from uh, history that the price of peace is war. Peace follows war. Question to the panel. Do you think we will have peace after this episode with Russia, after Russia is defeated and broken into small little countries where it can live in peace with the rest of the world? I'd like yeah. to answer that, because if, if you think about history, it's periodical. After each war, even the longest ones, there are always a peace agreement. Any kind of peace agreement, that's how it works, it's periodic. So it would be peace, probably different because it's a different world. Um, and in new era, so it would be peace for how long, I don't know, <coughs> but not in the same way we're thinking about uh, peace and war. But um, the contrast between peace and war, that's actually what defines this stage. Thank you, I think. I, uh, one last one. Yeah, point. it's this year's Nobel Peace Prize went to a um, Ukrainian organization called the Center for Civic Liberties and Oleksandr Matvichuk, and I'm proud, proud to be a friend of hers, um, who have been working for years and years collecting evidence of war crimes perpetrated by uh, Russians and Ukraine in this, in this war and have been help helping the victims of these crimes. And one thing I'd like to urge all of us to remember, there will be no peace in Ukraine without justice. That's a very good note on which to end. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank our distinguished panel. Uh, it's been a very stimulating session. They're also formidable authors, as you can see. Uh, um, so please take a look at their, their, their works. You know, um, uh, they are they are of some depth and uh, consideration. And I'd, thank you, I'd like to thank you very much for coming out for this fascinating discussion. So, thank you. Good night. Thank you.